Um, Elf, are we chatting about the Yeti Crab next? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Please. You won't actually hear my voice much in this next segment. Um, the week before last, a wonderful piece of news swept through the countryside and, and, and the world, um, popped up in Nature uh, in Nature News. It was a plus one paper, I believe, um, which means it's free and you can go and read it, which is cool. And it was talking about a new species of Yeti crab. Now, this is only the second species of this type of squat lobster called a Yeti crab that's ever been found. And they're really cute because they kind of look like Yetis. The, the first one um, ever found has the small white body and then these the front pincers are really, really long and look really furry and white as well. Hence the name. But um, yes, a new species has been described and I was lucky enough to be able to catch Karine Schnabel who is at Niwa and third author on the paper and uh, she told me a little bit about it. Karine, welcome. Thank you. Well, the Yeti crab generated quite a bit of an excitement in 2005 when a single specimen of a weird and wonderful crab was uh, collected off the uh, Galapagos Islands, or the Easter Islands on mm. the Eastern Pacific, about 3,000 meters deep, just next to um, one of those black smokers, those what we call hydrothermal vents. And um, it turned out to be an entirely new family of species, um, family of, of crabs, of what's called squat lobsters. And, um, but only a single specimen was collected, and it was so precious it got um, deposited in the Paris Museum, and um, it's really quite hard to get a hold of it, and, and you can't really find out more about the organism if you can't actually extract a little bit of tissue off it, or you can't really look into what this organism actually does down there, and there was not a lot of observations. So in... Um, 2006, the uh, colleague, um, Dr. Andrew Thurber, who was then at the Scripps Oceanographic Institution in America, in San Diego, off, um, in the West, um, Western America, um, was given this, this weird little specimen um, that was collected on a geological cruise down off um, Costa Rica. And uh, luckily enough, they, uh, they had figured out that that was actually something unusual and gave it to Andrew to look at. And he came and contacted me because I work on these squat lobsters, and it turns out to be a new species of yeti crab, the uh, the second one ever <laughs> ever collected, really. Um, and we went about to describe it. And we he went back and um, actually got to observe them and collect um, quite a few of them. And it turned out pretty quickly that they were um, engaging in this really interesting behavior. It looked, uh, there was uh, quite a lot of them sitting in one spot and they were all waving their arms from right to left. It looked a bit like a sort of a religious sort of, um, dance, yes, <laughs> dance, exactly, absolutely, and we do have a video that you'll be able to. Well, that that will enter in the post that accompanies this. Yeah, that's correct, and uh, you'll see a whole bunch of them sitting with their claws outstretched. And the claws, um, uh, the interesting part of this, and why this this paper is so interesting, is they look really furry, and that's because they have um, uh, these quite strong bristles growing on them and the furriness is the the bacteria that grow on them because instead of living around um, the hydrothermal um, vents or the black smokers these things live about 2,000 miles away on what's called cold seeps where um, methane and, and hydrocarbons actually come out of the ocean floor and seep and it's quite a rich and quite toxic environment for most animals but these things have adapted to live right there and uh, they uh, feed on, on these bacteria, which fuel these types of environments. Um, so um, the idea was that we would have a look at whether these furry claws um, and the bacteria actually are providing the food for, for these um, crabs, and that had never been documented before. So we, um, Andrew uh, went back home after we did the illustrations for these um, this species, and he actually looked at um, the, the food, which is in the guts, and making some... Um, so I'm so, um, extracting some tissue for, for different types of experiments and actually found out that um, they do and they provide them primary food source for these organisms. So that's the first time that's been shown for, for deep sea crabs. It's mostly been anecdotal in the past and, and um, they, you've been able to sort of watch that they seem to be grooming but that they actually use the, uh, the bacteria. Um, is, is something quite new. And there's other organisms around the world that, that live, that have adapted to living in these environments. And uh, some of them seem to be covered in, in, um, in bacteria mats, but that could be an artifact that they just happen to grow on there. But perhaps they also do do the same thing and actually farm these, these bacteria. That's absolutely wonderful. Okay. 
Um, cool. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for explaining that to us. Um, again, do have a look for the links that we'll post to the video to the um, newer invertebrate collection for which Karine works, um, the Facebook page where you can go and have a look at wonderful images of some of the critters, as we call them, in the collection. Um, we've got a critter of the week going at the moment. And uh, yeah, do stay uh, tuned. We'll, we'll try and do more of these. Thanks, Karine. Thank you very much. Cool. And uh, thanks again to Corinne uh, for talking with us about that. Also, by the way... It was fantastic. Also, yeah, and, and if anybody ever gets the chance to go and have a look at things like the Invertebrate Collection uh, at Newer, it's well worth the chance, <laughs> well worth the uh, shot. It's it's a pretty extraordinary place of things with jars. And yeah, yeah and the Invertebrate Collection doesn't include the scientists. No, just no, make, yeah. no. no, and a mammoth job. I mean, they're always trying to categorize what they've, what they've got, let alone what's coming in. Well, speaking of, of mammoth jobs, uh, in a really appallingly bad pun-induced segue, uh, there was another really interesting article about the heart of Jupiter this week, um, and whether it is in fact dissolving itself. So, this came up for a paper that was submitted to Physical Review Letters, and as many of our listeners will know, Jupiter is complicated, large, and exceedingly strange. Yeah. And we don't know half as much about it as we actually think. So a few of the things we do know is that it's about 320 times bigger than our entire planet. It has giant storms on it that last for anywhere between decades and centuries, mm. i.e. the Great Red Spot, and we still are not really sure what causes them. Mm. A single day on Jupiter is like 10 hours long, so it has a ridiculous rate of spin, it has a huge gravitational field, and it has one of the strangest magnetic fields that we've ever observed in the entire solar system. It is uh, just a planet of bizarre. Mm. And what this particular group of scientists have done is they've taken a look at this giant clump of bizarre, and they've tried to winkle out some knowledge from the heart of it. So what they did is they, um, they looked at the properties of the very core of Jupiter. So this is a very, very small, compact object at the center of Jupiter. It's about 10 times the size of the Earth. Uh, and because of the gravity of Jupiter around it and a few other effects, it's very, very dense and it's very, very hot. So the order of about 16,000 degrees Kelvin, which is about four times hotter than the interior of our sun. So this is, you know, than the exterior of our sun. So it's exceedingly hot and exceedingly dense mm, down there. Sure. So hot and dense, in fact, that they think there might be metallic hydrogen down there. <laughs> what they do know is that there is definitely a hydrogen-helium combination fluid somewhere down there at the planet's heart. But the question that comes out is how does that core interact with the rest of the gas and the rocky stuff, the ice and everything else, the mineral deposits that are around on Jupiter. And what this research, what these researchers did is they wrote a quantum mechanical model. They did some, uh, they did some calculations based on observations. And what they think is that um, because of this hydrogen helium fluid, this kind of messy metallic, very dense mass at the core, that the core itself is actually dissolving as it takes up uh, as it takes up uh, compounds like magnesium oxide from the outer layers of Jupiter, it will actually cause this inner core to dissolve. And so, over uh, you know, over the periods of billions of billions and billions of years, uh, this will actually cause the core to dissolve. And that dissolve, uh, that dissolving rate, will depend on the size or and composition of the planet itself, which is really cool. So uh, this is hopefully uh, that. Now they've made the model there, they're using um, some of the new orbiters, uh, the Galileo orbiter in particular, that's in orbit around Jupiter at the moment, uh, to look at some observations and see whether they match up with this particular theory. But if this is correct, this has implications for almost all of the exoplanets we've discovered in the Milky Way galaxy as well, because most of them are much, much more similar to Jupiter and Saturn than they are to Earth. And that's, it, it could be because there's more of those out there, and the more likely explanation is just that they're big, so we found them first. Yeah. Either way, this is seriously cool, and they say uh, in the particular article that they reckon they've made more progress in this in the past year than they have in the previous 20. Mm. That's absolutely incredible. Um, one of the, the, the fun facts that I like about Jupiter is the fact that the pressure is about 40 million atmospheres down there, at the <laughs> which is a number that I, I really do battle to understand just how 
how precious some that is. Um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting. I, as as I was reading this article for the first time today, I, I I had visions of a sort of spooky planet, you know, where the the the, the center of the planet isn't there, where it's just empty or hollow, which which gave me all shivers, and I got all freaked out and was like, ah, it's very strange, it's very strange. Uh, no, it turns out in this case, you probably don't have nothing. It's just it may not be the usual sort of solid core um, that we might be used to. Uh, and of course, there's there's other sort of um, information to be figured out about whether um, this dissolved uh, sort of magnesium oxide, which is uh, one of the key components in this rocky core, is cycled out or, or whether it sort of stays in the center but it's dissolved as it were. And, and for mm. that we, we really don't know and um, you know, are, do even bigger gas giants to their cores um, erode faster and then what happens? It's fascinating stuff. It's really, really cool. <laughs> 